Apple recently announced that the iPad OS 15 public beta is available, but how is it performing on the iPad Pro 9.7 inch, and what features are available? Let's start with the home screen. The home screen has seen a major update in iPad OS 15, but there are some things which I see as a downgrade. You can now place widgets anywhere on the home screen just like iOS 14. Furthermore, there are new widgets entirely such as Find My, Contacts, Game Center, App Store, and Mail. Reordering widget stacks has also been completely redesigned with a more user-friendly UI. Unfortunately, the Today view with the larger time has been completely removed. Instead, there is just a menu which blurs the screen similar to the iPhone when swiping to the left. Swiping all the way to the right, there is an app library which I think makes a lot of sense on the iPad. App library can also be accessed through the dock. However, this can be disabled if you'd like. Similar to iOS 14 and iOS 15, home screen pages can now be hidden and reordered. However, I'm not really sure why these features weren't included in iPadOS 14, as they were available on iOS 14. The thing I am most disappointed about is that less apps can now fit on a single home page. Previously, apps were 6x5 in landscape and portrait mode, but now it's 6x4 in landscape and portrait. This change had to be made in order to accommodate the widgets to fit nicely, so I guess it's a fair trade-off. But it's still a downgrade to have less apps on the home screen. While it is a downgrade, I do like the new home screen since I can place widgets on any home screen page, not just the first one which I've been asking for. The great thing though is this iPad gets these features. Multitasking also got a major upgrade which I have been waiting for years. There are now three dots at the top of every app. When tapping them, a new menu comes up with three options, full screen, split view, or slide over. When selecting one, your current app moves to the side and your home screen comes up, allowing you to choose any app you want. This makes it way easier to multitask and it's way more discoverable than the previous method. Previously, you were limited to only multitasking with the apps in the dock, but now you can choose any app you'd like, which is a great change. Furthermore, since the app library is available in the dock, you can simply drag out any app. Previously, you were limited to just the apps on the dock. You can now also open a floating window in some apps such as Mail. Also a big change to multitasking is the shelf. Now when you have multiple windows open of the same app such as Safari, there will be a new interface at the bottom showing all the open instances of that app. The shelf opens automatically when you open the app with multiple instances and disappears when you start interacting with the app. This really helps with understanding how many instances of the same app are open. After interacting with the app, you can reopen the shelf by tapping on the app in the dock. So it's simple and intuitive. The app switcher also got a few upgrades which aren't noticeable at first glance but really help with usability. You can now put two windows on top of each other to create a split view, and flick one of the apps out of the split view to make it back to full screen. Slide over apps are now also included in the app switcher. So overall, multitasking has gotten a huge upgrade in terms of usability and usefulness. Let's talk about the new notes app. You can now organize your notes by tags and those notes can be browsed through the tag browser in the sidebar. There is now an activity view which shows what each collaborator has done in the notes, similar to Google Docs. You can now also mention people by putting an at sign in the note. So let's say I want my friend to redo part of the note. I can just add them and they will get notified. Handwriting and images can now also be combined. You can even draw over images directly in the notes app, which can be useful. However, I think the biggest feature in notes is Quick Note. It can be activated through Control Center, a keyboard shortcut, or a flick of your Apple Pencil or finger from the bottom right corner. Quick notes are adaptable, so they can be adjusted in size or they can be hidden on the side and brought back later. After making a quick note, either through typing or through a stylus, the quick note goes in a special section in the notes app. Links can also be dragged in the quick note, which can be useful. Messages has also gotten a pretty nice upgrade. Probably the biggest part of the upgrade is shared with you. Now when someone sends you a song in Apple Music, an article in Safari, an article in News, or something along those lines, there will be a shared with you section in that specific app. So let's say my friend sends me a photo of their trip. Now when I go into the For You tab of my Photos app, there's a Shared With You section which contains the photos sent to me by my friend. This is a useful feature since it integrates nicely with other apps. Another big upgrade is when someone sends you a bunch of photos, they will be in a stack instead of taking up the whole screen. Do Not Disturb has also gotten a big upgrade with a new feature called Focus. So I can create a new focus for filming a video which can block certain or all notifications and matching home screen pages with focuses. When someone attempts to message you, they will see that you have a focus on. Notifications also have a whole new design with large app icons. 
There's also a notification summary which takes all the less important notifications in one large notification. You get to choose which notifications are included in the summary. Safari has a major update, which I really like except for one issue which you will get to. Safari now has a way thinner tab bar, which makes the page more immersive. The tabs bar color now also blends in with the site. The issue I have though is the more menu. This menu hides away basic functions such as refresh and reader mode, which used to be a tap away. Everything now takes an extra tap which isn't really necessary, but I like the new look and more immersive feel. Tab groups allow you to group your tabs together in the sidebar, which can be useful when working on a certain thing. Also the customizable start page now has to summarize privacy report, a background image, series suggestions, etc. similar to macOS. Extensions are now also available which is amazing but extensions have to be updated for the iPad. The new sidebar now organizes everything such as tab groups, history, bookmarks, and private window. So overall, I think the new Safari is great and hopefully Apple fixes the more menu issue. Probably my favorite feature in this whole update is Universal Control, and happily it is available on this iPad. Universal Control allows you to use a single mouse trackpad and keyboard across your iPad and Mac by simply moving your iPad near the Mac. This feature does require a Mac though. However, while all these features are available on this iPad, there are some major features in iPadOS 15 which require an A12 chip or later, which are not available on this iPad due to the older chipset. So first up, some features in FaceTime are completely absent, while some are fully featured. Spatial audio, the feature which makes the person's voice come from their placement on the screen, is fully absent. Portrait mode, which blurs your background, is also fully absent. Voice isolation mode, which blocks out background noise, and wide spectrum mode, which prioritizes every sound into the call are both also absent, despite being listed as compatible on Apple's website, so maybe it's an early beta thing. Grid view and group FaceTime calls, FaceTime links, and shared play are fully available. Another app which has some features absent is Maps. The interactive globe, which is similar to Google Earth, is absent, and the new detailed map view is also absent, otherwise the other features are fully available. Another feature which is entirely absent on this iPad is live text. Live text allows you to copy text from the camera viewfinder, photos, screenshots, etc. Visual lookup is also not here which gives you a description of the photo you're looking at. For example, if I'm looking at a photo of the Eiffel Tower, it will let me know more about that specific landmark. Unfortunately, Siri's on-device processing for offline tasks such as turning on Bluetooth, setting timers, etc. requires a neural engine which the A9X does not include. Therefore, on-device Siri processing is not available on this iPad. This means this iPad will not gain the fast on-device processing, offline Siri, or on-device personalization. Now let's talk about what Siri can do on this iPad. Siri can now share items on your screen, such as photos. So let's say I'm looking at an article in Safari. I can just ask Siri to send it to my friend. Furthermore, if you're looking at a contact on your screen, you can just tell Siri message them I'm on the way. Siri can now also understand contacts better, just like the Google Assistant. So if I ask how tall is the Eiffel Tower, I can then ask what is the address without mentioning the Eiffel Tower again. These features are all available on this iPad. iCloud Plus is also completely new, with a private relay option which is pretty much a VPN. Hide My Email allows you to use a randomized email that forwards to you when signing up for services. If that service starts to spam you, that random email you provided can be completely shut down to stop them. However, you do need an iCloud storage plan to use these features. Now let's talk about some of the smaller but still very useful features. First of all, you can now finally share multiple voice demos at once. I've been waiting for this for years and I'm so glad it's finally here. Playback speech can also be adjusted now, and silence can be fully skipped in recordings with just a tap. The Translate app is now on the iPad after a year of being on the iPhone. It has writing support with a stylus thanks to the iPad's larger display, but I can't seem to get that working on the first beta. Photos now also has an info page which shows you the metadata of the shot including which app it came from if it's a screenshot. And finally we made it to the last thing on the list, performance and bugs. This is important and makes it or breaks it for an iOS or iPadOS update. iPadOS 15 feels slightly more stuttery and laggy in some areas of the OS, that is totally expected in this beta stage. I also experienced a couple of resprings and a crash in the settings app so far, but it's not super major to stop me from updating. The battery life is slightly worse, but nothing major. There is a low power mode to help with that though. It's a beta, so things will improve later on. So in conclusion, this is an exceptional update for all iPads. The reason behind the controversy and the dissatisfaction from iPad OS 15 is the M1 iPad Pro. I do have to say for those iPads, it is a bit disappointing, since they are capable of so much more. But for every other iPad, I think this is a really good update, 
It's packed with tons of features which makes it more major than iPadOS 14 and around the same level as iPadOS 13. So if you have been thinking of getting the public beta for this model iPad, I would say it depends. If you're okay with some minor bugs, a more stuttery user interface, and some occasional restrings and worse battery life by a little bit, then I would say it's not a bad idea. Performance is okay though, and of course the feature set is pretty great. I really like this update and I'm sure the final version will have these issues resolved. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.